So this morning we talked a little bit about Genesis 1. Today we're actually going to skip over Exodus and go to Leviticus for a little bit. Uh, but before we go there, we'll start maybe in Hebrews, go to Leviticus. Have you ever had a problem in your life? Or are you one of those fortunate ones that never had to deal with the problem at all? If you say you are, you're probably lying on the Sabbath day too. How's that? But I'm sure we all deal with problems. Some challenges are bigger, some are smaller. And uh, I'd like to propose to you that God has a problem too. Um, but before I get into God's problem, why don't we just pause and ask the Holy Spirit again to lead us in our study. Would that be okay? Let's, let's pray. Gracious Father, I do thank you again for the privilege to open your word, to share your word. I just ask that the thoughts that I have and, and the words that I speak may be pleasing to you, but I pray that you may be my rock, my redeemer, and that Jesus is uplifted and that you give clarity of thought. And above all, as we see Christ through your word, that we may be drawn to him, that he may live in us and through us, and that you continue to transform us to be more like you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Well, you may say, what problem could God have? Well, God does have a big problem. There are a lot of people that God loves that he wishes could be with him. And you say, well, that's not a problem. If God loves us so much and wants us to be with him, why doesn't he just come and take us home? And the problem is, if, if uh, God would take us home today as we are, he would reintroduce sin to the rest of the universe. And you say, well, I don't see another problem there. Then why doesn't God just remove sin from our lives right now and come and take us home? Uh, have you ever tried removing sin from someone's life? <laughs> have you ever tried removing sin from your own life? How's that going? And so some people say, well, why doesn't he just destroy sin and then come and take us home? Well, if God would destroy sin right now, many of the people that he loves would be destroyed. And so you're starting to understand a little bit of God's problem. He wants to take us home, but if he takes us now, he takes sin back with him. If he destroys sin now, it destroys us. So God has a problem. And the problem is how to save the sinner and destroy the sin. And how to take the sinner home without taking the sin home. Well, God does have a solution to his problem. The solution is called the atonement. How to bring about at one with God. Uh, if you have your Bibles, let's start with Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. All right. Last time I was here, I was told I went too short, so I'll try to double it this time. <laughs> All right. Hebrews chapter 8. We'll start in verse 1. Now, this is the main point. And whenever the author says it's the main point, it's the main point. Of the things which we are saying, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected. Who? The Lord. The Lord. And not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now... He has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he, also, he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. What Paul is saying in Hebrews is that God has a solution to the sin problem and it is through the ministry of Jesus Christ. 
in a place called a sanctuary, a tabernacle, which God set up and not man, right? And that's how God is solving his problem. In order for us to understand what Jesus is doing for us, in order to deal with our sins, we kind of need to go back to the copy. And if we see something in the copy, we may understand some of what Jesus is doing, right? Amen. Are you with me? Amen. All right, so let's go to the times of Moses to Leviticus chapter 4. Now, the book of Leviticus is an amazing book. When I was young and started reading the Bible, I would love Genesis because of the stories. I would enjoy part of Exodus, and then it got into details that took me longer to guide through. And then as I got into Leviticus, I kind of said, I'm done. That was just my experience. But I found out that uh, in the Jewish economy, they actually start teaching their young men in the book of Leviticus first. And Leviticus teaches holiness. And then now you can go into the rest of Scripture. And so Leviticus is really about purity and holiness. And so if you look at, it starts off with all sorts of types of sacrifices. But if we go to chapter 4, Leviticus chapter 4, we're dealing with sin offering because God's problem is with what? Sin. sin. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2 says, It was your sins that have separated you from God. So God's problem is sin. This deals with sin offering. Verse 1, Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally, please note that. The Lord wants us to get to know Him, and He wants us to stop sinning intentionally. Now we have sinful natures, right? So we struggle. But He doesn't want us to be the type of person that went up to the priest and said, forgive me, Father, I stole two bags of potatoes from the church. And the Father says, it was you who took those bags of potatoes. Yes, Father, it was me. But only one bag is missing. He says, yes, Father, they were too heavy. I'm planning to come back for the second bag tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord doesn't want us to premeditate sin. And then come back to him and say, oh, I'm so sorry. That's why the author says there what? Don't go out sinning and think that you can come back to God and play. Because sin is serious to God. Hopefully we'll come to that and understand it more. But it says, if a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord and anything which ought not to be done, and does any of them, if the anointed priest sins bringing guilt on the people, and then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, lay his hand on the bull's head, and kill the bull before the Lord. I want you to note that when a person sins, they bring an offering. It could be a lamb, it could be a goat, it could be a bull, but if a priest sins, it has to be a bull. There's greater responsibility on the breast. It costs more to bring a bull than a lamb, right? But note a couple of things. If you would have lived in the time of Moses and you sinned, let's suppose that you went out and you played basketball with some guys. I know it's the time of Moses, they didn't play basketball. But let's just suppose you're out playing basketball. And as you're playing, you get competitive and you really want to win. And your competitive spirit takes over. And you say some things and you play in a way that you say, man, I sinned. And I know I've been there. I have some friends who can say I've been there. All right. But when you sin, what is the wages of sin? Death. 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 Now, because you've sinned, you deserve to die. But you don't want to die. You didn't intentionally want to harm somebody, say things, hurt feelings, but you did. And you apologize, but according to the laws of Moses, what you needed to do is find a lamb, a preferable unblemished lamb, or a goat, or if you want to, a bull. You lead it to the sanctuary. You come into the court. You meet the priest there. You put your hand on the innocent animal. 
and you put your hand on it and you confess your sin. And you say, I played basketball yesterday and the way I played basketball was not in the right spirit. And I ask forgiveness for my sins. And after you confess in detail what you've committed, then the priest hands you a knife. And now you have to take the life of that innocent animal. Is that what it says in verse 4? It says, he shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord, lay his hand on the bull's head, and kill the bull before the Lord. Now, did the lamb play basketball and hurt people's feelings? Was the lamb innocent? Why did the lamb die? He died for your sins, right? And so it was what we would call a substitution. And you were able to go home free. And the lesson that brings about in this is the fact that when you and I come face to face with Jesus, he points us to the cross and he doesn't say, Edward, I died for the sins of the world. <coughs> what he says is, Edward, I died for the sins that you have committed. And then he tries to bring into my mind not the fact that he's the savior of the world, that he died for the sins of the world, but the fact that it was my sins that nailed him to the tree. Is there a difference between the two? There was a man named John Newton who uh, wrote poems. I guess uh, we know some of them and sing some of them. And one of the poems that he wrote, this was a man who lived a sinful life, who didn't care about God until one day he met Jesus Christ through the scriptures and he came face to face with the cross. And listen how well he shares his experience in this poem. It says, In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object struck my side and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his, his cross I stood. Sure, never to my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now my tears are vain. Where shall my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, have slain. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for your ransom paid. I'll die that you may live. Thus, while his death my sin displays in all its blackest hue, such is the mystery of grace. It seals my pardon too. With pleasing grief and mournful joy, my spirit now is filled, that I should such a life destroy, yet live by him I killed. And so in this poem, he catches two amazing aspects of the cross. Number one, that when you and I come to the cross, it should awaken in us the reality that our sins nailed him there. Not the sins of my neighbor or that of Hitler or that of Stalin. It was my sins. When you go to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12. I know it's one of those minor prophets. It's right before Matthew. You have Malachi and then Zechariah. Zechariah, Malachi, and then Matthew. All right, Zechariah chapter 12. Watch this. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Who is that? That's Jesus. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Did you catch that? They will look on me whom they pierced. 
I read about a funeral one time when a family was grieving the loss of their son. And the tragedy of the way they lost their son, his dad was rushing out for work and he got in the car and then realized that his son came out to say goodbye and he accidentally backed over him. And so it's a tragic event where the father knows <coughs> my son died because of me. Now, I don't think anyone went up to the son to say, oh, don't feel bad, Father, you didn't mean to do it. That are not helpful words. The reality is that when we look at the cross and think of sin, we think of the fact that I'm the one that killed Jesus. It was my sin that nailed him to the tree. It is the sins that I choose to live in. But there are two parts of sin. One is my sinful actions. But where do those sinful actions come from? They come from a sinful nature. And so why do we choose to sin? It's because our nature is sin. I, I like to use an illustration of a frog and a scorpion. The scorpion is standing on the riverbank and wants to cross over the river. But of course the scorpion is not able to swim. And so as he's standing there, a frog comes near him, and the scorpion says, Can I hop on your back so that you can take me over to the other side? And the frog says, No way, Jose, you're not getting on my back. You're a scorpion. You will sting me. I will die. We're not doing this. And the scorpion says, Why would I ever do that? If I sting you, you go down, I go down. This made sense to the frog. And so he allowed the scorpion to get on his back. And so halfway through, the frog feels a sting in his back. And his little hind legs, as they were pedaling along, freeze up. And he knows the scorpion is stinging him. And as they're both going down into the river, the frog asks, Why did you do it? Why did you do it? And that's the question. Why do we sin? Cut on the scorpion, right? And the answer is, it's my nature <laughs> to sting. And really, you know, it's not that simple. That brings us back to God's problem. It's not enough to, for God to come down and say, listen, your sins is what's keeping this issue going along. Would you just stop sinning and we could all take care of this? It's, it's not that simple for God to tell us to stop sinning. Nor is it fair for somebody to come to you and say, now you just stop sinning and it's all going to be good. It's not because our actions are sinful. The issue is our nature is sinful. And so God has to deal with our nature as well. And so there are two things that happen on the cross. Number one, we need to wake up to the reality that sin is bad. It's bad. we got to stop loving it. We have to come to the conclusion in our minds that say, those things are bad. It's kind of like, let's say this is a stove here, and I put my hand on it, and I say, oh, somebody left that on. That is hot. But if I come to you and say, wow, that stove is hot. It's really hot. And you say, Edward, it can't be that high. Your hand is still on it. Many people say, oh, sin is horrible. It's horrible. And they still just love it and dabble in it. What we need to come to the realization is it's a decision. God wants to wake us up that sin is bad. Let's make a decision about sin. Second thing we need to do is not about sin, but at that same place, the cross, God awakens something else, love. Not that sin is bad, but that God is love. Amen. Because when I come to the cross, I not only see the fact that sin has nailed him there, but that he chose to die for my sins. So when I come to the cross, and I look at Jesus dying for my sins. And I ask Jesus, what are you trying to tell me? He would say something like this, Edward, you can spit on me, reject me, hurt me. 
but you can never stop me from loving you. I love you. I want to save you. I want you to be with me forever. I love you. See, that's the other part of the cross. Love awakens something in our hearts. Not only to try to do better, because doing better is not the answer. But opening up our hearts to someone who alone can remove the sin and transform our nature. Right? Right? So, when we come to the cross, we see the beauty of Jesus. But, that is not, that is not the whole answer. Because after we come to the cross, we still have a life to live. But I want to read to you from the book called Education. I think it's page 263. 260, 262, 263. Listen to this. Those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel, think of it in relation to themselves and to the world. And in other words, when we think of Jesus coming soon, we often think of it in relation to us and the world. Oh, I wish this sin would end so we can be with God. Yeah. Few think of its relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with His manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God. So what we see at the cross and the pain that sin has caused God on the cross, it didn't begin at the cross for God. It began when Lucifer decided to sin up in heaven. The agony of the cross has begun a long time ago. Education, page 263. Every departure from the right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. So when we think of sin and for sin to end, we often think of it in relation to us. But God's servant says, think of it in relation to God. How much does God want for sin to end? How much it hurts Him? How much pain it has cost Him? If we wish it for end, for, for sin to end, how much more does He? Right? Yeah. All right. And so, if we could awaken in our hearts our response to the love of God, now we have a beginning. Then we pick up the story here back in, in um, Leviticus chapter 4. Go back to Leviticus chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. All right, Leviticus chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. See, it's not over. You've gone, you've gone to the priest. You put your hand on the lamb. You confessed your sin. The lamb died for you. You go home forgiven. You get to live. But it's not over. See, the priest does something. Watch this, verse 5. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. So, one thing you'll notice in Leviticus, the word blood shows up a lot. It always points to the blood of Jesus. And in Leviticus, what cleanses is blood. You want to clean something? You don't use water. You use blood. Because what cleanses sin is the blood of Jesus. What does not cleanse sin is me doing better. Me doing better is a result of Him cleansing sin. You see? He transforms me to not be the person that I used to be. All right? So, all right. So, notice, as you have done your thing and the blood flows, the priest in a cup catches it, then he goes where with it? To the holy place, right? So, what does that mean? What does that point to 
If we think back to Hebrews chapter 8, once Jesus died on the cross, His work of dealing with our sins did not end. It only continues. You see? Now Jesus went up to heaven with His own blood to be in the heavenly sanctuary. So what does that mean? Well, in the heavenly sanctuary, I'm just going to go here a second. You have multiple rooms in your house, don't you not? I hope your house is not just one big room. You have bedroom, and you have a kitchen, and you have a bathroom, and you may have a living room, I don't know. But you have at least three different types of rooms in your house. Why do you have multiple rooms in your house? Oh, for different purposes. Because you don't sleep in the kitchen, right? And you don't cook in your bedroom. And so God has multiple rooms too. He has a court. He has a holy place. He has a most holy place. Why does He have multiple rooms? Well, because each room has for a different purpose. And so the purpose of the holy place is for the blood to go in there in order to cover sin. So let's say this is my sin right here. All right? Jesus takes it up into the holy place. He covers my sin with His blood. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. But the problem is, it's still there. The purpose of the most holy place is to wipe it out. Wipe it out. One deals with covering it. The other deals with wiping it out. So that it's no longer there. And in order for Him to wipe it out there, He needs to transform it here. Does that make sense? The two work together in a sense. And so you have multiple rooms in your house. Now how does God wipe out sin in the most holy place? You know, we can get into this whole thing. Jesus went up into heaven. He covers us. He represents us. But what does that mean for me down here in a practical sense? Go to Hebrews chapter 10. We're coming to an end now. Hebrews chapter 10. All right. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's begin in verse, verse 1. Are you there in Hebrews 10? Verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. What is Paul saying here? For then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshippers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin. What Paul is saying is that the earthly sanctuary never really dealt with sin. It only pointed to the reality of how God deals with it. Because if it actually would have dealt with sin, they really would have been purified in heart. Okay? So the earthly sanctuary is not what deals with sin. It's the heavenly sanctuary. That was just a shadow. That's what he's saying. Now if you keep reading, verse 3, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. In other words, if you have something spilt on the carpet... You may say, well, I can take that out with water. But if it's grape juice or something that really stains, you may say, well, I can't take that out with water. And so what he's saying is here, listen, <coughs> the blood of lambs will not deal with your sins. Amen. Cleansing the sins is not that easy. It needs to be something stronger to deal with sin. All right? And so he goes on to say here in verse 5. Therefore. Now, when, whenever you see the word therefore, it's there for a reason. See, he made, his, he made his argument for now. And then he comes it. Comes to a, a very important part. When he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, 
I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will O God so what he's saying is look these sacrifices of animals that does not deal with sin therefore you prepared a body for me that I can deal with it so why did we have the earthly sanctuary and all those sacrifices and 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 things that they did what was the purpose of that well suppose you invite me over to your house and I come over and and, and enjoy a you know a couple of great slices of pie and uh, I see a beautiful vase that you have in your living room there and I pick it up and I just admire the artwork on that vase and I say this is spectacular but then I fumble it and it falls to the ground and shatters into pieces I I feel really bad wouldn't you feel bad mm -hmm. I said oh I'm so sorry I I'll, I'll buy you another one where'd you pick this up and you know I feel sorry about it I really would buy you another one and then you tell me I hate to tell you Edward but <laughs> that was one of its kind and they only have one other one in Pennsylvania and it's worth a million dollars now I don't know why you'd keep a vase like that open for anybody to handle in the first place but I was sorry when I broke it when I thought I could replace it how much more sorry am I now you're <laughs> when I realize whoa I, broke. <laughs> I can't replace this so so what God is trying to do with the earthly sanctuary is okay you're sorry with your sins how sorry are you when you realize that it's the Lamb of God that has to die for it you see the difference and so the purpose of the earthly sanctuary is to awaken us to our need of the blood of Jesus Amen. awaken us that we can we can't deal with this sin problem of ourselves. Me trying to do better ain't going to cut it. Amen. It's more complicated. It's harder. I need to be sorry enough to go to Jesus and ask Him to deal with it. All right? In humility. Now, notice. So, let's continue here in, in verse... Uh, let's pick it up and, and come to a close here in verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I love it. Mm, amen. For by one offering, he has perfected, which, which is past tense, forever those who are being <laughs> sanctified. Isn't that awesome? In his eyes, we're perfect, amen. and yet he's still sanctifying us. Huh. That's the good news of the gospel. Amen. That you and I perfect. may still be a sinner. But in his eyes, we're perfect. Amen. <laughs> because he has never lost a case. Because there's no mess he can't clean up. Amen. And as long as you give yourself to Jesus in all your sin problems, trust him. He can clean the mess up. You are perfect Amen. while he's sanctifying you. <laughs> I love it. All right. But notice verse 15. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he, he has said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will be, remember no more. And verse 18, now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering of, for sin. A time will come. When there will be no need of offering for sin. Amen. When will that happen? Sins are in remission. That's right. <laughs> when he can write his laws on our hearts and our minds. Amen. Now what does that mean for God to write his law on our hearts and on our minds? When we think of the law, what do we think of? We think of the Ten Commandments, right? Alright, so I'm going to put here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I wish every church would have a whiteboard next to the pulpit. This is great. I'm a, just a scribbler. This is fantastic. All these PowerPoints and stuff, it's terrible. All right. Okay, here it is. I love this. 
Ten Commandments. God, you, you may say God wants to write the Ten Commandments. Is that what he's saying? I think he's saying something more than that. You remember when Jesus came, he said, Well, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, or you've heard it said. Do you remember that? All right, so Jesus goes to the spirit of the law. The law is, I think that's the law. Yep. Love. And that can be broken down to how to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, right? Yep. And this, how to love your neighbor as yourself, all right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that when uh, a lawyer came to Jesus and said, tell me what's the greatest commandment? And he told him, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Really, Jesus said God is love, mm -hmm. broken down to love God, love your neighbor. What's the point of the rest of the Bible? I say the rest of the Bible are illustrations of these. Amen. You can go to any story of the Bible and it's a lesson on one of those commandments. Amen. On love. Amen. Whether it's not love or real love. Huh. You see? It all points to that. We could look at some illustrations, but we won't. The whole point is when you read the Bible, read it in the sense of, what do I see about God's love? How do I see God's love distorted? Where has this human being fallen short in love? You see? Now, what God wants to do is write this love where? Minds and hearts. What's the difference between the two? Well, there was a little boy once who wanted to stand and be fidgety and, and mom got a little bit just tired and said, son, sit down. And he didn't want to sit down. He said, no, mom, I'm standing. And mom looked and said, son, if you don't sit down, I'm telling you. And he realized he's serious. So while he took a stare forward, he sat down, he looked at her and said, mom, I may be sitting on the outside, but I want you to know I'm standing in my heart. <laughs> you see? And that goes to show you that a lot of times the heart may be somewhere else. And so what it means for God to write the law on our minds is that I start studying it and getting to know His Word. It, it's in here. But it's not enough to get well-versed in God's Word. He does not just want to write it here. He wants it to move from up here down towards over here. Amen. And why is that so important? Well, many of us have kids. And we sometimes may get a little bit frustrated with our kids. Does that ever happen to you or no? So, oh, okay, there we go. We have an honest person. We do. We do. Now, I know there's a law in the state of Ohio. I haven't looked it up, but I'm sure there is. It's kind of crude, but I, I, I'm sure there's a law that says you can't harm your kids on purpose. I'm sure there is a law like that. It's written somewhere in the laws. I'm sure there is. And let me tell you, when your kids aggravate you, what keeps you from really going at that boy or girl? Is it because it comes into your mind, there's a law in Ohio. It's my is, that, is, is that it? <laughs> is it? <laughs> is it that law? No, it's no. law. <laughs> it's not because the law is in the books in the state of Ohio. It's because the law is in your heart. Amen. You see, the difference is you love that child. Amen. And it doesn't matter how far they push their butt, your buttons. That child is safe because the law is in your heart. Amen. And so what the Lord wants to do is He wants to write His law of love, not only into my mind, but He wants to do it into my heart. How does He do that? Well, I wish he would just take it and Xerox it in, like a copy machine, and Xerox it straight into my heart. But it's more of an exposure of a long time. The way God writes His law into your heart, 
is that you spend time with Him. Amen. And you commune with Him. And you talk to Him. We call that prayer. And you let Him talk to you. We call that meditating on God's Word. Studying God's Word. And asking Him, Lord, write this, not only in my mind, but write it in my heart. That I may not only know Your Word, but I would love it with my whole heart. And when He can write it both into your mind and into your heart, guess what's happening? He is cleansing you, transforming you, so that when He comes back, He can destroy the sin and take you home. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. My father passed away maybe about seven years ago now. He passed away from lung cancer, never smoked, but uh, he, he worked in construction all his life, very hard worker. One of the things I learned from my dad is, is to have a hard work ethic. He, he was one of those Eastern Europeans that came to America that had to work to support the family. When we came here, we had nothing. And so he worked very hard to put food on the table, to put a roof over our heads. And he would wake up early in the morning and go out on the construction site and work. And in the summers, when we wouldn't be in school, in high school, we would go with him because he could get more work done and get more money. And so I, I never liked the Eastern European mentality of working from sun up to sundown. But we would be out there working and those roofers and others, carpenters, would go home around 4 o'clock and... I would be just making another batch of mortar, knowing we're going to stay here a few more hours. He had a very strong work ethic. But one of the things I remember, a vivid memory of my dad, is I started pastoring up in Cleveland, and my wife and I had a vacation coming up, and we decided to visit our families down in Atlanta. And both her parents, my parents lived in Atlanta. We drove from Cleveland to Atlanta. And Maria decided to spend a couple of days with her parents. My dad was on his way to Alabama to do a job. I thought, you know, I'll spend a couple of days with my dad. And so I got in the car with him. Uh, we drove over to Alabama. That first day, we worked hard. I mean, this pastor hands was not used to that kind of work anymore. And when we got back to the hotel, I fell asleep just like that. I mean, I was tired. But early in the morning, the light comes on in the room way too early for me and as I open my eyes up my dad gets up and he takes a hymnal of all things he had a, a, a Romanian hymn, hymnal that he had with him and he opened up the hymnal and he sang a song and in my mind I thought oh I can sleep a little longer this is so great and he sang a song and after he sang a song he took his Bible and he read it. And I thought, oh good, I can sleep a little more. And then after he read the Bible, I peeked over out of my eye and I saw he knelt by his bed. And he prayed. And you know, I don't remember my dad ever telling me, Edward, you got to spend time with Jesus. But I do remember seeing that that my dad, who was a construction worker, he had his mistakes. I know his mistakes. I'm his son. And I probably pushed him to some of those mistakes. And my brothers probably knew how to push his buttons. But I do remember this, that every morning he sang a song. That he spent time with Jesus. That he prayed. And I know what was happening. Jesus was writing his law of love into my dad's Amen. mind Amen. and into my dad's heart. Amen. And I said, that's what I want for my life. Amen. That's what I want for my children's life. I want Jesus to write it into our hearts and minds. Amen. And in order for him to do that, it doesn't mean I got to try harder. It means I got to spend time with him. Amen. Amen. That's how he does it. Amen. And so, my dear friends, God has a problem. He's solving it. I want to be part of the solution. Amen. Don't you? Amen. So why don't we make time daily to spend time with Jesus? Amen.
Let him write it into our hearts and minds, his law of love. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, thank you so much that you are our God of love. That you're not only the powerful creator God, but you're our relational Father who loved us so much that instead of abandoning us in our sins, you gave your only begotten Son to die the death that we deserve. And Lord, how could we ever repay you for that love? We can't change ourselves. Only you can change us. Thank you that there's power in the blood. Thank you that the blood of Jesus can cleanse us. And thank you that even now, we have the privilege to look to Jesus as our high priest. And that we can commune with Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you may continue to write your law of love into our hearts and into our minds. And I pray that every day we commune with you and draw closer to you. And in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.